what I want to talk about then are some, some of these five things that are kind of going on in agriculture right now, some of which I'm operating in, some of which I think matter up here um, or to the state of Wisconsin. The first one is gene editing. Um, it's a brand new thing in the last few years, and what gene editing does is you go in and edit individual amino acids to change the genome to whatever you want. And so, um, and it's going to be a big deal. It's going to be very precise. It's really going to change that stuff. Um, like drought tolerance, cold tolerance, changing flavors and colors, qualities, um, disease resistance, all kinds of stuff. Um, but I don't work in that so much. I do work in insect um, and weed management a lot. And um, the one thing they're talking about is something called a gene drive. Um, and what a gene drive is, they do happen naturally. Um, and, you know, when you, you know, sexual reproducing species, um, you get half your DNA from your mom, half your DNA from your dad. That's just how it works. Um, and so you have a 50% chance of getting stuff. Well, what this gene drive does is if one of the parents has it, your kids all have it, and their kids will all have it, and their kids will all have it. And it's just like super um, inheritability. It all, they all get it. Um, and so what they want to do is go in and gene edit, um, change the species, and then release it in the breeding population, and all the children and children's children and children, et cetera, will have it. Pretty soon the whole population's that way. They want to do it so things like mosquitoes are no longer able to transmit diseases. The big one they want to knock out is malaria. The big other thing is big data is coming. Um, you've all heard about big data, and ag has been collecting piles of information, and nobody knows what to do with it yet. We just have a lot of information. Nobody knows what to do with it, literally. They, you do the simple stuff, look at your yield maps, and then, okay, there's a bad spot there. Oh, that's because blah, 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 you can fix it. But then after that, they don't know what to do with it. And I've talked to farmers. They have buckets where they just take all their flash drives or thumb drives, a whole bunch of information. Every few weeks, they get it, oh, throw it in the bucket. And they just have buckets of this information. They don't know what to do with it yet. We're starting to work on that. And that's going to bring a lot of efficiency, reduction in pesticide use, nutrient use that you don't need. Third is large dairies are coming um, to the U.S. and to Wisconsin. Um, some of you might be aware of what's going on in the state. You know, we've got these larger dairies, three, four, five, six thousand, eight thousand cow dairies here in Wisconsin and coming around all around the country. It's economies of scale. You start out with, you know, you only got 10, 15, 20, 30 cows. Your cost to make a gallon or a hundred weight of milk is a certain number of dollars. Then as you expand, you gain efficiencies. You spread out fixed costs over more and more units, and the cost comes down. Well, I guess from your side. High cost, we have low numbers. Then as you add, increase the number of cows, the cost falls. That's economies of scale. Nationally, we have some, not even quite 10 million cows in the U.S. And the, the numbers are, you know, that means if everybody on average has 2,000 cows, that's only 4,500 dairies in the, in the country. And then if everyone has 4,000 cows, it's half that, 2,200. You get 6,000 cows, um, that you're talking 1,100 dairies in the country. Um, three, 400 of them in the state of Wisconsin is all you'd need, and that'd be it. And we've done that already in other, in other industries. You know, there's not a lot of orange growers. There's not a lot of carrot growers. Someday, I think the numbers, the, there's just strong economic forces pushing towards these larger dairies because the cost keeps coming down. People respond to prices. Fourth trend is population and income growth. Um, and I'm sure you all heard, seven billion people, we got 10 billion or some big number. You know, the rate of growth has been slowing, but we're getting, there's just more people. And the reality is, is the, um, we'll top out, you know, 10, 11 billion or something like that. And the big one, though, is, is the, um, it's not so much the population growth is that the people are having more money. The world is developing, and these, that basically means demand. It's not so much more people as much as they all have money and they want better things. Um, they don't want rice. They want something, more vegetables, more fruits, more meat. Um, and that's going to be a big push. But a lot of that is, it shows up, you don't see it as much as it's the price. The price is the signal that tells a farmer how much corn to plant, how much soybeans to plant, how much wheat to plant, or plant something else. Um, and we've, we had that price boom a few years ago. Um, we added 3 million acres of crops uh, in the U.S. cropland, most of it corn. This is nationally. Wisconsin only has 5 million acres of corn, so imagine going from hardly any corn to what we have. Um, and it's up in the Dakotas. It's up in... Um, Manitoba, Canada went from being a corn importer to a corn exporter during that time period. And that's where you start to worry about the North Woods. It could be potentially be turnable into cropland. Um, the, supposedly the lower peninsula of Michigan is the crops have been moving north there. Um, and that's where you kind of get into that big fifth trend is climate change. You can talk about the politics you want, I don't care. Um, it's more it's happening. The weather's changing. You can argue about whether it, who does it or why, if it's human caused or not. 
um, you talk to farmers, we've done a survey, um, you, I, we got to publish it. And farmers don't think climate change is scientifically proven, but they're sure the weather's changing and they don't really, don't, it's not so much an issue to them as, we'll just adapt. Well, what did that mean? What are you going to do? We'll change the crops to grow, we'll change the, um, we'll use slightly different technology, you know, maybe, um, you know, irrigation, um, and then there'll be more um, things like crop insurance and relying on sort of those kind of programs, insurance or changing the leasing structures and stuff like that. Or simply just move, stop growing the crop and move somewhere else. It's a real issue in the sense that it can make um, agriculture or different kinds of agriculture profitable in places like this. And that's the pressure you're going to face. Look around our world. Everything we call modern physical culture, the tables, the floors, the clothes we wear, the stuff we eat, the vehicles we drive, etc., comes from two places. We dig it out of the ground or we grow it. That's pretty much all of our material culture. That's where it comes from. We dig it out of the ground or we grow it. I can't, I have a hard time finding something that doesn't really fit that. So then the question is, if we like having modern culture, where are you going to dig it out of the ground? Where are you going to grow it? Um, that has to come from somewhere. And prices tell us that. Um, where do you want to put different things? And, um, but you always have to, where are you going to put this stuff? Where are you going to put your digging? Where are you going to put your growing at? Um, and then you have to ask yourself, do you want it in the North Woods or not? There are jobs, but there's also things up here that are much different that are also beneficial. I think, you know, recreation and some of these other, there's forestry that is another raw, you know, we grow wood and we use wood and wood fibers for lots of different things. Um, there's that whole side of things. And, um, and that's, is it better to use this for forestry and recreation or for agriculture? I've always heard that the growing season is defined by the time from between the last frost in the spring and the first frost in the fall, and that that period is pretty short up here and limits economical agriculture. To what yeah. extent is that true, and is that changing? Is that yeah. increasing that period because of climate change? Yeah, it basically the last frost is coming a little earlier it's basically the growing season is getting a little longer a little bit longer in the spring you get a little bit you get in a little earlier in the spring and get out a little later in the fall and then plant breeding has just gotten so much better um that we because you yeah the, the light regime changes and that affects plant a whole bunch of plant things change um because of the how long the day is and that triggers things and so they can breed that it just takes a little time to get the the crop ready for the different light regime um and frankly what you do is you just plant them closer together is another thing the short growing season, the key then is to get, get it in as soon as possible. So cold tolerance, genetically engineered, will be great. Um, they do some seed treatments on the soil in case it's a little cool. It kills off any of the, the bacteria or pathogens that will make your seed rot while it's waiting until it warms up. And then um, planting it close together so as fast as possible you get canopy closure and capture all the sunlight. That's what we do up north. You go further south and they plant the plants further apart because you don't, you're not in such a big rush because seed's expensive. Um, so we can deal with that, um, and this season you can see the data has gotten a little longer, um, and so that means we can get certain crops through faster. So do you think the, um, the large mega dairy farms are going to drive all the smaller ones out of business? It doesn't drive them out of business is that they decide to quit because they can't live with those prices. That's what it is, um, in the sense of they, the big farms can produce milk at a lower price, and so I'll make up a number here. Milk sells, so make up a number, $18 a hundredweight. Well, if it costs you $20 a hundredweight, after a while you can say, you know, I can't, I'm not going to sell milk anymore at 18. I'm going to quit. Um, whereas the other guy can graze it for $17 a hundredweight. He says, yeah, I'll keep doing it. I always tell the students, markets are brutal. They, they, that's how they work. And if you can't survive at that price, you're going to face the brutal choices. You're going to earn below average returns or you're going to go do something else. <laughs>